Welcome to The Forgotten, Season 2, Episode 6. Mr. Kennedy Goes Hollywood. There are milestones in everyone's life. For some, it may be the graduation or doctorate, finishing their job training, winning a sporting event, procreating or seeing your grandchildren grow up. Now we have arrived at one of Joseph P. Kennedy's milestones. Over the course of the years 1924 and 1925, he has acquired his own businesses, becoming his own master. As you might imagine, the already quite occupied upstart did not at all decrease his workload by achieving this. This week, we will see Joseph P. Kennedy performing a never more difficult split between his career at his new cash cow FBO and family life. But let us first take a look at his new work environment, the movie industry. As we have seen last week, the common perception of the motion picture industry was not particularly a good one. Scandals and outrages were the daily name of the game. The rich bosses of the companies, from Warner Brothers to 20th Century Fox, and all the other big media companies like First National and Paramount were said to be run by immoral, greedy and sex-crazed Jews. The sex craze part, however, had something to it. The wickedness of the movie industry, and their particularly raunchy westerns and depictions of antiquity, did not go too well with the Puritan American society and their rather Christian beliefs. This, of course, had not gone unnoticed by the bigger movie companies. Putting their usual quarrels, and yes, there were many, aside, they organized their own lobby group, the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America, the MPPDA. This organization, under their first head, Will H. Hayes, former Postmaster General, quickly created a checklist, commonly known as the Don'ts and Be Carefuls, which set up rules for movies to be produced. This, of course, was meant to keep the motion picture industry under the radar of the watchful government, which was more than eager to cleanse America of all smut to be created. So what were those rules? Some obvious things like graphic sex, scenes of childbirth, children's sex organs and so forth. But some of the things like white slavery, vulgar expressions connected to the name of God, even if you could only read them on the lips of the silent movie actors, or other religious terms, or even ridicule of the clergy, found their way onto the list. As you can see, the MPPDA must have been quite fearful of a massive censorship movement in the US government. However, this was far from being enough, as none of this was really enforced by any official or semi-official groups. Still, it eased the pressure on the movie producers, and we will see more on that topic later. Kennedy's strategy, as already mentioned, was completely different. He put an effort into marketing himself as the incarnation of American values and his movies as a bonfire of either American heroism or culture. To achieve this, he restructured his cast. Because back in the day, actors were bound to their respective studios by contract and they were not really allowed to work for other companies. Kennedy put a focus on all American beauties and athletes far from being outright vulgar and sexy but well-mannered and photogenic. As back in the day at the court of the Sun King in France, debutants had to introduce themselves properly. So it was more than necessary for Joe Kennedy to make a big impression on his first official press release to the public and industry insiders. That happened on the 9th of July 1926, in a large advertisement in the New York Times and other great newspapers. The message was conveyed by Fred Thompson, the greatest cowboy movie star of the time, and his trusty horse Silver King. The well-known and well-mannered cowboy spoke to the masses directly. The text itself was a declaration of war to the old studios. Clean up the stage. Make it as clean as the screen. I produce clean photo plays with my pal, Silver King, but I make him hum with action, flame with romance, boom with comedy, whiz with thrills and Silver performs some of the greatest tricks you ever saw. You please the whole family. So do I. 
While this, of course, does sound like a circus director advertising his show, Joe Kennedy was more than certain about the challenge he had just placed. His further public outlets to journalists and his ads, using his own face, all kept focusing on the American Films for Americans doctrine. Most of his work, however, was still performed from New York. Although the distance between New York and Boston, which would take four hours even using today's trains, was more than substantial, Joe did not think of moving. He did not want his children having to switch schools. He did not want his wife having to reorient in a new social environment. Instead, he rented a nice house for his family time and summer vacations in Hyannis Port in 1926, known today as the Kennedy Compound, and housing the Joseph P. Kennedy House, a museum. He would purchase it later in 1928 and spend most of his time there. His relationship to his children was one of a loving but permanently absent father. Joe had, by all means, no time for his family, but what little he had, he spent with great joy. Whenever he was at home, all children had to assemble and would be called into his office, one by one, telling him everything he had missed, getting some much-needed advice, or some child if they needed it, and in general, he took a deeper interest in them. That went so far as Joe, trying to be as close as possible from the other side of the US in Los Angeles, asking his boys for funny things they could think of, so he could incorporate them in his movies. Whenever he was not at home, a situation which would become ever more common over the course of the next years, he stayed in contact via a great amount of letters. A large amount of them is still conserved in the great book Hostage to Fortune, edited by Amanda Smith, which gives a much deeper view on Joe Kennedy than I could possibly cater for, and which I wholeheartedly recommend. Be that as it may, FBO was still in a bad financial shape. So, as I mentioned last week, the budget of each movie had to be reduced. While the biggest companies like MGM or Fox paid between $190,000 and $275,000 on average for each movie, FBO usually spent around $50,000. But while the actual quality of the movie suffered, Kennedy's marketing successes and the usage of Fred Thompson, who was not, as I said last week, let off immediately after Kennedy assumed command, but rather became the star of FBO's first box office success in years, the movie Jesse James in 1927. Coming back to the good old topic of censorship for a short time, I wish to put a little light on one of Kennedy's letters to his biggest star so far, from February 25th, 1927. In this letter, Kennedy reports to Thompson that he did have an uncomfortable meeting with Will Hayes, the man still in charge of the MPPDA, who was worried that Jesse James had just glorified a historical villain, a subject that was a little touchy according to Hayes' don'ts and be carefuls. He wrote that Hayes was afraid to glorify the bandits because of the criticisms that will come from the preacher element the most vocal supporters of state-based involuntary censorship. But thanks to Kennedy's white vest image, he got let off the hook once again. While Hayes actually had, quote, refused to allow anybody to make this picture, meaning that the movie was not to be distributed, he only reconsidered this decision because of Thompson's and Kennedy's clean accounts. Had Hayes withdrawn his support from this movie, this financial disaster would probably have ruined FBO. However, the movie was a box office success, with an income of over $1.2 million, which would be almost $17 million in today's currency. This gave Kennedy more than enough budget to work with. But Thompson would be even more useful once again, which makes my slip from last week even less understandable. As I already mentioned, Thompson was more than expensive. His weekly salary being somewhere around $137,000 in today's currency. This enormous sum, probably a result of Thompson being ranked second in both 1926's and 1927's box office star ranking, was a thorn in Kennedy's side. So he used his star as a trump card. Knowing that the way larger Paramount Studios had a keen interest in Thompson, Kennedy brokered a deal. Thompson simply was to be borrowed to Paramount for four movies while still being on the payroll of FBO. How does this help, do you ask? 
Well, uh, for the quite little sum of $75,000, FBO would be named co-producer of all those movies, and that way be entitled to a part of their incomes. In addition, this investment would even be returned, with a bonus of $100,000 plus $15,000 every week for Thompson's salary in this time. While those movies were still quite profitable, they were considered B-movies even back in the day, although their budgets were substantially higher than anything FBO could afford. As you might have imagined, this deal was a huge success for Kennedy and his company. Thompson, however, would die in 1928, after contracting tetanus from stepping on a rusty nail. So, apparently, in those mid to late 20s, the world was in order for Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. of Brookline, Massachusetts. FBO was propelled out of its financial troubles by two major successes. His family was in order, his sons grew up to be intelligent young men, and his financial dealings, which I will neglect a little, by now were going excellent as well. Kennedy, having always been a frequent visitor to New York City, was marveled by the opulent Big Apple and its meritocratic society. While he objected moving his family to the city when he first moved his main office there, mainly because he did not want to force his children to change their schools, he quickly changed his opinion. Boston is bigoted, he noted to a friend, meaning that even coming generations of Boston's upper class would never be able to overlook the Irish heritage of his family. Besides that, his ever more successful business endeavors just consumed more and more of his time, so reducing the amount of cities he had to be present from time to time, from three to two, was probably mostly an economic decision. So, on the 24th September 1927, the Kennedy family moved into an opulent house on the corner of 5040 Independence Avenue and 252nd Street in Riverdale, to this date one of the best parts of the city. Nonetheless, his long office hours in his headquarters at 1560 Broadway forced him to rather sleep in a nearby hotel than going home, so even after they moved, his family did not see much more of him than before. His life and his legacy changed on a single day. On November 7th, one of his many, many Hollywood acquaintances would ask him via telegram whether he was interested to meet the famed actress Gloria Swanson tonight for business talk. The telegram stated that Gloria needs handling and needs to be properly financed. So Kennedy, of course having made a name for himself with the Paramount deal, seemed like the perfect address. Apparently the muscular, attractive Bostonian quasi-aristocrat made a sharp impression on the young actress. So far, Born in 1899, she was probably one of the brightest and most colorful people in America at the time. Daughter of a soldier and starting off as no more than an extra to bigger stars like Charlie Chaplin, she quickly rose through the ranks of the American motion picture culture. From 1919 to the early 20s, she became the most wanted actress, her sex appeal and character entrancing her audience. She had been offered a million dollars by Paramount Studios, but declined and went to United Artists. Her frequent quarrels with the MPPDA and their don'ts and be carefuls, as well as her more than opulent lifestyle and her many failed marriages, she was in her third with French actor Henri Marquis de la Falaise de la Coudrier, would usually have made her unattractive for Kennedy's prudish movies, but still the meeting was one of the most important events in Kennedy's life so far. Kennedy obviously never left any testimony of that night, but Swanson sure did. Kennedy apparently tried to woo the great actors with some professional-sounding bank talk, allegedly uttering that nobody in Hollywood knew how to make a balance sheet that gave a banker what he needed, and after reviewing her rather precarious finances, agreed to take care of them. But of course, as you might already know, this meeting was far from being business only. Instead, Swanson was, according to Nassau, enchanted by the boyish banker who was trying so hard to impress her with his knowledge of banking. On the other hand, Kennedy had to find a replacement for his big star, who was basically given to Paramount for good, of course not knowing that he would die next year. So Joe had something to lose as well. However, after the talks had ended successfully, and Swanson had withdrawn to her hotel room, Kennedy called her multiple times and asked if she wanted to go out for dinner. 
one of her later husbands, her sixth to be exact, said that Kennedy greatly exploited the fact that Swanson had been, quote, exploited by Jews. And Kennedy, presenting himself as a proper banker and upright businessman, looked once again like the knight in shining armor, who was to save her from the claws of perverted studio owners and greedy accountants. In addition to that, there was no doubt that sexual attraction had sparked from the first few moments of their meeting. Swanson was the perfect opportunity for Kennedy to move up the class of his movies. With the aggregated capital from successes as The Gorilla Hunt, which Kennedy apparently had left after five minutes in disgust, Jesse James and the Paramount deal, he could finally leave the B-movie league and join the big players. The first cooperative project of Swanson and Kennedy should be Queen Kelly, and that, my dear listeners, could probably be titled Everything that can go wrong when producing a movie, the movie. But let's start in the beginning. First and foremost, it is important to mention that FBO did not convert to sound as early as possible. Not that Kennedy did not plan it to. Instead, he even invested in it. David Sarnoff's company RCA profited from $500,000 of FBO and Kennedy capital flowing into it. This Radio Corporation of America was one of the biggest innovators of commercial radio and sound technology. Of course, this included the installation of RCA photophones in all FBO-ran theaters. What Sarnoff did not know was that Kennedy intended to butcher the price of RCA's shares to incorporate them later. Once he found out, the deal was shattered, as well as Sarnoff's immediate business future and Kennedy did not have the opportunity to incorporate the most modern equipment into his theatres, voiced movies. Secondly, over the vacation season in 1928, we have an odd situation. While Kennedy, as usual, went to the Porn Beach Resort, and his wife and kids went elsewhere, unexpectedly, beware the connotation marks, Gloria Swanson and her husband Henri were there at the same time. Kennedy, a bit sour about the reports that Swanson hired more and more personal staff for herself and on her own payroll, obviously demanding that Kennedy resolve the financial havoc with company or, God forbid, his money, was not too excited about her stay. In the beginning, that is. Although her husband was present, rather busy with golfing and relaxing, we can assume that it came to the first sexual encounters between Joe and Gloria during this vacation. I find it rather hard to orient this sexual relationship in Kennedy's life. While his wife was the epitome of a pure Boston-bred upper-class wife, Swanson was rather raunchy, had a devil-may-care attitude and was rather flirty. It was probably only his sex drive and his lonesomeness that made Joe do this, not love. Rose Kennedy, his wife, denied any claim that this affair had taken place to her dying bed. So it is hard to say whether Rose had a big problem with the entire thing and if she even wanted to know about it. The big problem for the movie was that Swanson now always had Kennedy's ear and that she biased many of his decisions about the upcoming film. This leads us to the third problem, the choice of director. But this choice was of course not in the hand of the star itself. Swanson was, quote, both delighted and a bit frightened when Kennedy's Lieutenant Eddie Moore, with whom she was particularly close, called and told her that Joe had got Erich von Stroheim for the movie. Who was this von Stroheim? Erich Oswald Stroheim, born in Vienna, not at all nobility, he had just claimed to be once he migrated to the US, was a maniacal genius of a movie director. Starting off as a consultant on German culture and fashion in 1914's Hollywood, he quickly rose through the ranks, as Swanson did, and directed his first movies in 1919. He was a dictator on the set. He did himself not know what he wanted, so apparently he was a complete bum to work with. Although what he produced was absolutely sublime and would become film school stock material over the course of the century, he did not even think about bowing to the rules of the MPPDA. He produced movies of up to eight hours in length, demanding nothing of them would be cut out. This led to a big disaster called The Wedding March, which is nowadays deemed a treasure of directing, but failed at the box office for being too high up for the common viewer. So this pseudo-aristocrat from Austria was in need of a new job, and as Kennedy wanted to make an 
quote, important film, as Nasor concludes, he needed an important director. So he was more than happy to take him, being convinced that him and Gloria could control him with ease. But New York and his family called time and again, meaning that Kennedy would be absent from the set with disastrous consequences. Upon hearing of Kennedy's choice of director, national and international movie press burst out in fireworks of laughter and malice, never believing Kennedy would be able to tame this beast. Before we come to this entire debacle, another thing changed in the Kennedy household. Before we come to this entire debacle, another thing changed in the Kennedy household. The Kennedy family left New York and moved to an improved and expanded version of the Hyannis Port House in May 1929, but the next episode will focus more on his private life. Shooting of the movie began November 1st, 1928, after several falling outs with Stroheim over the script, the budget, the cast and several other issues. Kennedy, lacking the producer experience to control a man as Stroheim himself, and being more of a visitor to the set than a real producer, did indeed not manage to have any influence on the shooting of the movie whatsoever. And Swanson, who had figured she could control him herself, was powerless against the rash decision-making and dictatorial style of the director. While everything he deemed unnecessary was usually everything Kennedy's lieutenants and Swanson wanted to keep in the movie, everything he deemed a masterpiece was usually long and expensive scenes everyone else wanted to cut out or cut short. He invested way more money than he was allowed to, threatening his withdrawal from the movie if Kennedy didn't comply, and so he did. As Swanson as well threatened withdrawal and even activated her husband to petition Kennedy, the situation kept escalating. After almost two months, only the small first part was shot. Furthermore, the movie had everything that would make the MPPDA furious, from sex scenes to disregard for the clergy, and would probably have never made it past their censorship. This leads us to a rather new facet of Kennedy's personality. In February 1929, he finally decided to cancel the production. He fired Stroheim and immediately traveled to Los Angeles. Swanson notes that when he rushed into her bungalow, he wept only saying, I have never had a failure in my life. Still, Swanson blamed Kennedy for the debacle, and their relationship was soured. Swanson wanted to have a great breakthrough with this movie, a much-needed breakthrough, and Joe was to deliver exactly that and no less. And what did he deliver? A not even half-finished mess, costing around $800,000, about $11 million in today's currency. She suffered a nervous collapse and had to be brought to a hospital. Funnily enough, Stroheim was applauded by many of Kennedy's Hollywood adversaries to finally have tamed the beast. The non-artist banker who rivaled their business and delivered him a defeat, if I may compare and refer to the first season, at least the size of Leipzig 1813. Even when he was trying to restart the project in April 1929, Swanson, still furious about what she deemed Kennedy's mistake, blocked the new script and every change, so he could not recover at all from this crisis. So the movie was finally shelved, being a colossal yet amusing business failure. In addition to this misfortune, just when he arrived in Los Angeles again after a lengthy stay in New York, trying to reorganize the movie, on May 17th he got the message that PJ, his beloved father, had died and Kennedy had no possibility to make it to the funeral in time. Yet, even in the face of those odds, Kennedy did not let his high spirits go. Instead, he moved on, both to save his movie companies, by now incorporating the Pathé Studios as well, as well as Gloria's net worth and her career, and he quickly reorganized his style. He incorporated audio technology, producing a talkie called The Trespasser in only three months. Apparently, as he discovered, Gloria Swanson was not only a talented actress, but also a talented singer. And as if the Almighty had his hand in it, the movie premiere in London was an absolute success. Not completely repairing the financial damage of Queen Kelly, it was an insanely popular talkie debut for Swanson, and Kennedy had restored his honor. Actually, the premiere was the first time Rose and Swanson met each other, and they went shopping. It is hard to say whether Rose knew about this affair, 
but I sincerely doubt that she did at this point. According to Nassau, this secret was a Hollywood secret, not really being a secret in Hollywood, but absolutely unknown outside the industry. And although Swanson petitioned Kennedy to leave his family and move to LA, Kennedy had absolutely no intention to do so. So, while the entire affair was quite probably something he could be bragging about when he met with his Harvard companions, who, as it was quite common back then, probably had their own affairs, he never really took it seriously. According to several of Joe's biographers, Gloria and Joe never spent more than six weeks at the same place. And even though Swanson's memoirs claim how much Kennedy was in love with her, we can probably agree on the fact that it was just sex, nothing more. To conclude this entire thing, as David Nassau put it, the inescapable truth was that for Joseph P. Kennedy, Gloria Swanson was another sexual conquest, one of many he would fit in his business life. That he wandered from his marriage bed was inconsequential to him. Adultery was a sin, but one easily forgiven. Next time, we will see Joseph P. Kennedy's last days in the movie industry, as well as him weathering the Great Depression and stock market crash of 1929. Furthermore, we will put a special focus on his family life, which I have neglected this week for the sake of digestibility. I say next time, because the regular show will be put on hold until the 7th of January, on a Christmas and New Year's vacation. I do hope you weather both the unsavory modern Christmas dress as well as New Year's Eve celebrations well, and that I will see you again next year, or, as we say in German, Frohes Fest und guten Rutsch. For those of you who are interested in the Forgotten Episodes, the little sideshow about forgotten events in history, be sure to tune in this Friday, the 21st of December, for the first episode on the Cretan War. I wish you a good day or a good night. See you next time.